This is Health Yeah, your weekly update on what's going on in the health, wellness, and medical world with Monica Robbins. Six million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease today. Six million families are coping with this diagnosis. Six million families are searching for hope. Today, we discuss the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's. What is normal aging and when is it something more? We look at the therapies available, including a new medication just approved that is showing signs of promise for dementia patients. Uh, I have three young kids. It means more time with my kids. Um, means more time with my family. Plus, the resources available for family members who have the crushing task of helping their loved one fight this disease. Everything you need to know about Alzheimer's and dementia in this edition of Prescription for Life, straight ahead. And welcome to Prescription for Life. I'm Monica Robbins. There has been a lot of talk of Alzheimer's disease in the news lately. The FDA just approved a brand new drug that's offering a glimmer of hope to many. We'll get to that in just a moment. We've also seen some high profile cases. Actor Bruce Willis's family talking about his dementia diagnosis and the family of former First Lady Rosalind Carter talking about her diagnosis. It is a very cruel disease, a silent disease, and one with no known cure. Today, we're talking talking to an expert on Alzheimer's, asking your questions and getting answers on everything from how to know if forgetfulness is something more serious than just aging. And we talk about the best therapies available to patients today. But first, let's talk about that new drug. It's called Lecanemab, sold as Lecembi. It was just granted full FDA approval and studies have shown it can reduce the signs of memory loss by 27% in patients with early stage dementia. Let me clarify, it can slow the progression. We're going to hear more on this from our expert in just a moment, but first, Here's more from our station, KARE in Minneapolis. Let's see what else I can find. For Canada Yazbek, her family story is her story. This is my great grandma. So she was the one that wasn't diagnosed until later. Canada's grandma had early onset Alzheimer's. She was the first diagnosed, yep. Canada is the seventh in her family to know the disease all too well. At 40, I became symptomatic. And at 41, I received my diagnosis with of MCI, mild cognitive impairment, which really just starts my journey. Now 49, Canada will be able to access Lakembi. The reason this is so important right now is because CMS or the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services said they would not cover the drugs unless they are fully FDA approved. Susan Perry at CEO of Alzheimer's Association, Minnesota and North Dakota chapter says even with full approval, there are more hurdles. CMS has said they'll cover it, but we need to be, they need to be part of a registry or the physicians need to. And that's adding an undue burden onto clinics and hospital systems, physicians, and for patients. Some advocates are hesitant to be all in given the price tag and equity concerns. But Canada and Susan say time is of the essence with 2,000 people a day progressing past the point of being able to take the drug. Uh, I have three young kids. It means more time with my kids. Um, it means more time with my family. Really, really, though, my kids, that's a big one. More time with them. Another barrier to this drug is its price tag, more than $25,000 a year. We talked to our Cleveland Clinic expert about that and so much more. Take a look. We are joined now by Dr. Kathleen Rogers, Chief of Geriatric Medicine at Cleveland Clinic Akron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. This is a topic so many people have questions about because the numbers are staggering. Six million have Alzheimer's right now. One in three seniors will die with dementia and those numbers are expected to double. Why? You know, people now are living much longer than they did before. So age is an independent risk factor of developing dementia. And a lot of times with the medicine that we have now that does prolong life, even with medication side effects with the types of diseases that you may have could also accelerate or unmask dementia in many patients. So why do women seem to get diagnosed with this more than men? That's a good question. Women 
tend to live longer than men. They are caregivers, so they have a lot of stress that's related to it. They also may seek attention sooner than men do. Um, and as a result, they get diagnosed and they want to be treated sooner so they can continue being caregivers and nurturers of their home. So black and Hispanic Americans also get diagnosed more often. Why is that? That's very interesting. There was a study that showed that the black population did have the ApoE4 gene and also another gene that metabolizes cholesterol um, together could cause vascular changes and also um, increase risk of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia in these populations. So as a result, uh, they do get diagnosed with dementia much more than the general population. Are there illnesses or viruses that you're concerned about that could potentially potentially lead to brain damage or, or, you know, dementia down the road? With COVID being the most recent virus, we have seen many patients, even with mild disease, as simple as a cold, developing forgetfulness with word finding difficulties and even to the point of something called MCI, which is my cognitive impairment, which could precede dementia. Um, and over time, this could potentiate uh, changes to independent lifestyle and therefore causing dementia. Other diseases like diabetes, cholesterol, high blood pressure, even strokes and heart attacks can potentiate something called um, vascular dementia. Wow, and we've had a couple of celebrities uh, yes. just recently diagnosed, Bruce Willis being one. There are several different kinds of dementia. Where does Alzheimer's fit? into all that, and what are these different types? I would begin by defining dementia as forgetfulness that affects daily function. And this is forgetfulness that is daily, but also does not help continuing daily life, even with reminders or tools. Um, and as a result, you will need outside help to help you do daily things, daily tasks like medications and driving, um, et cetera. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia that we see. Almost 70% are diagnosed um, uh, type of dementia is Alzheimer's. Um, the second being vascular and Lewy body dementia. Um, vascular, if you have a stroke, uh, a TIA, or even heart disease could potentiate uh, vascular. Lewy body is more like the name suggests, Lewy body um, that is deposited on your brain, um, which can cause hallucinations and memory loss. And then you have Parkinson's, which is a type of Lewy body dementia. Um, Frontotemporal, like Bruce Willis was recently in the news, where you will have um, neuropsychiatric type uh, symptoms um, with also hyperorality and you know many impulsive type symptoms in addition to memory loss and dementia. If there are so many different kinds, do they all have the same signs and symptoms? Because we always think of forgetfulness. Right. Is that the first warning sign or could any of these have different symptoms? More often than not, people will start to seek help when they start to get more forgetful, um, especially when their independence is starting to get affected. Uh, and forgetfulness seems to be the first line. But for example, with vascular, um, you will see all of a sudden there is a stepwise decline with the patient where they were so independent and now needing more help. Um, in Alzheimer's, as we know, it's a slow progressive decline over many years. In Lewy body and Parkinson's, you might see some motor type symptoms, some tremors, but also forgetfulness that uh, augments uh, the disease or you know accompanies it. And um, also with frontotemporal, you have other behavioral type symptoms in addition to memory loss. And there are many smaller types of dementias that typically we do see in a younger population, uh, but in the uh, older population, it's the, the, these are the main types that we would see. So ask any woman in menopause, she'll tell you she constantly <laughs> forgets where her keys are or anything right. else. And the same thing with moms with young kids, right. you know, forgetfulness is common. So how do you know when it's forgetfulness that is just part of daily living compared to forgetfulness that you need to take seriously? Forgetfulness that's part of daily living often is infrequent. And yes, you may forget 
uh, your keys or word finding. I'm like, what is that? A, you know, what did I forget? What's her name or his name? And then you, you do remember it days or maybe hours later. But if this becomes more frequent, if this starts to affect your ability to drive familiar places or your ability to balance your checkbook, your ability to care for yourself independently, that's when you need to seek medical attention to make sure this is not anything more serious. Is this something I can just go to my primary care physician and ask them or do I need to make an appointment with a specialist like you? The primary care physicians are the front line and many times you establish a relationship so they know how you were and if this is a change, they could guide you to a referral for a specialist like myself. But many primary care providers can do testing in their office. Huge news on the treatment front that we're gonna to get to in just a second, but when people get this devastating diagnosis, mm -hmm. what do you tell them? What are the options? The biggest thing that I tell my patients is it's okay to take it in because it is a diagnosis just like as you get older, diabetes or hypertension, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, but it is life altering because when you hear the word dementia, it changes your perspective of life. Um, so when you do get a diagnosis of dementia, once you're accepting of the diagnosis and start looking into treatment options, I also recommend all of my patients to look into estate planning, finding a support a network of support that could help you walk through your journey throughout your stages of dementia, because it is important to have community in addition to medical treatments for the dementia. So we've heard about monoclonal antibodies with the COVID pandemic and now uh, the FDA approving lecanemab. What is this drug and who's it for? Lecanemab is one of the newer medications that is used for patients who are in the much earlier um, disease states like my cognitive impairment or, or even early, early Alzheimer's disease. What it does is it helps slow down the plaque deposition on the, on the brain and as a result, slow down the whole process in patients with Alzheimer's disease. It does come with side effects um, as in intracerebral bleeding, edema or brain swelling. Um, but there are many um, research studies, like the Cleveland Clinic is doing a research study where we are trying to identify earlier onset of patients, especially uh, in the mild cognitive impairment before it even reaches dementia, where we can maybe alter the direction of uh, the progression into dementia, for example. So is this drug, though, going to be affordable? Is it going to be available to, to those with early onset? That's the idea, that it will be available. It is costly though, so a lot of um, uh, national organizations like the American Geriatric Society is working with Medicare to make this affordable and covered so patients who do qualify would be able to afford this and get advantage of this medication. You know, a lot of people with family history, and I'm one of them, we think, okay, you have to exercise your brain, do word games, crossword puzzles, word you know, all of those things, are they really useful? Absolutely. Um, what I typically tell my patients is challenge your brain. Don't let your brain get comfortable. Our brains are set to be on cruise control to conserve energy. A lot of the times when you do things like crossword puzzles or Wordle, you get used to the strategy and you're not really challenging your brain. The best way to continue challenging your brain and preventing the onset or even slowing down dementia progression is to keep challenging your brain. The highest evidence that we have is with learning a new language or even learning an instrument that you've never done before. Wow. Okay, I'm not sure I'm ready to go there <laughs> unless I have a really good trip coming up. But, um, you know, I have a genetic risk because both of my parents had dementia. My mom just was diagnosed. So from somebody from my perspective or people who have that, what they perceive as a genetic risk, what is my risk or what should I be doing now? 
If you do have parents that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia, my first step would be talk with your provider and possibly get genetic testing. If you do have a gene that predisposes you to higher risk of dementia, you may qualify for research treatments like we just talked about, or you could do other things in terms of lifestyle to help delay the progression of dementia. So when somebody gets this diagnosis, it's not just theirs. Mm -hmm. It affects their caregivers, their family members. So what is your best advice? What is it I'm sure you have to say to patients every day and their families? Dementia is a horrible disease. It really is hard on not only the patient, but the journey and people who walk with them. And people who are caregivers are typically family members who have known them their whole life. So when this comes on with the patient, it's difficult for them to understand why. Why does my mom or dad not understand that this is something that we've discussed before. There is an analogy that I use with my patients that uh, it is a regression. So if, for example, if there's a stage of Alzheimer's dementia where they start having incontinence of bowel and bladder, and if they need to, um, they forget how to dress themselves in seasonal clothing, it connects to a, the stage of a three-year-old. So whatever strategies that works for that stage as a toddler would work for your loved one in that stage of dementia. It's just easier to handle the disease as a whole rather than looking at specific behaviors. Any hope? Yes. There is hope. There's a lot of research trials. Um, and right at this moment, we have a lot of organizations that for example, the Alzheimer's Association, Cleveland Clinic doing a lot of research. We are coming up with therapies and there is always hope that one day we are going to find that medication that will help our loved ones. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. As we mentioned, dementia has been in the news lately because of some high profile diagnoses. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter and actor Bruce Willis. Willis's family announced his diagnosis on a social media post, a post that caught the attention of one woman who understood exactly what they were going through. Here's more from our station WFMY in Greensboro, North Carolina. W9330 posted, my husband had this horrible disease. You are in my thoughts and prayers. I lost him 10 months ago at age 57. I commend them for coming forward with it as they, you know, they have the resources a lot of people don't and they can step back and, and quietly endure this. And instead she has, you know, um, made it known that she wants the world to know about it. And it's just, it's a game changer for all of us. Wendy Knight is from Arizona. Her husband, Rob Knight, was diagnosed with frontotemporal degeneration or FTD in 2019. I think I have her home. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. That was Rob in 2020 man. at age 55. She was such a hands-on dad and great um, husband and coach. And um, he was in the mortgage business, very friendly and just, you know, knocked it out of the park on every level. And then this is just to watch the deterioration. Devastating. I mean, beyond words, you know. FTD is known as the cruelest disease you've probably never heard of. Knight hopes Bruce Willis's diagnosis will help raise awareness across the globe. People need to realize that this is a hideous disease and um, the families and um, even caretakers that are involved, it's just, it's devastating. Um, and again, it's just, you know, there's no words to, to put anything you know, you can't label this disease because it's just so, um, just so cruel. Wendy lost her husband last year. We donated his brain um, to Brain Sport Network. He just, he had no frontal lobe. Like there was, you could see in his video how deteriorated it was. Um, so imagine that three years later. I mean, his, his brain was, was tiny in the front and actually on the temporal lobes as well. So he had, he was, he couldn't even talk at the end. He just made noises for about a year. But of course, COVID was a setback. So we used to go all the time and sing with him. And then when we were, you know, we couldn't see him, then he deteriorated as he didn't have us with him to sing. Now her heart is with Bruce Willis and his family.
we didn't know what was going on with my husband for years, probably a good 10 years. Um, and so that our, our journey was, was really, really rough as they all are. Um, so my heart just goes out, you know, to the Moors and the Willises for what they're, what they're enduring and what they're about to endure because it, it gets ugly. My takeaway from all of this with the um, with Bruce Willis is that that people look at this disease and try and educate themselves. Be aware, it's out there. It's tackling the young, male, female. It is um, it is prevalent, and we need to um, make it known so we can find a, a treatment and ultimately a cure. A Cleveland Clinic study found that while all caregiving is difficult, caregivers of those with Alzheimer's and dementia are more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. It truly is a disease that impacts the entire family. If you or someone you love is struggling with dementia, we wish you all the best on your journey. We hope we were able to give you just a bit of hope today, and we hope that you know you're not alone. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Prescription for Life. We'll see you back here next week. Until then, I'm Monica Robbins wishing you good health. Thank you so much for tuning into Health Yeah. Please find me on Twitter and Instagram at Monica Robbins. Like and follow my Facebook page, Monica Robbins WKYC. Find video podcasts at Monica Robbins channel on YouTube. And please subscribe. Wishing you great health and hope to see you again soon. Thanks for listening to Health Yeah! with Monica Robbins from WKYC Studios. Subscribe now so you never miss an update. And find more on everything you heard here on WKYC.com and on the WKYC app.